Well, and they come from a place of not understanding, right? They don't understand why people are behaving the way they are. They don't understand what it takes to it's have like, a conversation with someone. It's like the people you went to law school with, right. policing the right. neighborhoods that didn't Absolutely. grow up in. It's like, oh, you know what's going to happen. Right. And even if you reverse the role, if the guys that grew up in the inner city were to go police the... Like, the way they conducted them is something, by right. something different for them. I'm like, you know, so I think it's all about getting a better understanding. I think um, uh, community police policing needs to be. We need the cops on the beat, like swat the beat, like you know they used to what? Yeah. Come out your car. Yeah. You know, I just don't want to see your cruiser. Come and on. Come, and come talk to people. Come on. In a way that doesn't intimidate and scare them. And why don't you not start off with patting them down? Because that's probably not going to be the start of a positive conversation, right? Like, no, no, I mean, you don't go up to people and just pat not, them down and just say, No, hey, hey how's it going? I'm going to grab you right now and see what's going on in your boxer shorts. Like, that's not the introduction to a positive conversation. And, you know, it just it doesn't have to happen that way. No, 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 no. no so, yeah, I feel like if, if, if when the, uh, it's so absurd to me that Police officer could go to how long is the uh, police academy? The training? Oh, I think it's like nine or ten months or something. A year, something like Less that. Less than a year, and then you as a lawyer got to do three. But yet, yeah, look at the position you play as a lawyer and what you have to learn, and then look at the position they play. You would think that they even... they need to be more or well informed on, on some on some level, not just come off the street and get hired and then boom, you're out there. I think it's about well informed, and you know. I find that with a lot of police officers, there's this fear factor, right? They're scared of people who are suffering from mental health issues. They're scared of people who are drug addicts. You know, that's why they walk up and the first thing they want to do is pat you down and make sure they're not going to get shot. Well, someone walking around with a gun isn't just looking to run up and start shooting police officers. It happens, but that's not really what they're mm -hmm. doing. If they're just standing on a street corner, maybe they're, More they're drugs, maybe they're away. not. They might right? like to leave Absolutely. because they're They don't want, they're not there to cause trouble with you. They're not about to start flashing their gun because they don't want you to see it. So if you're just really wanting to have a conversation and make sure they're safe and talk about the people around them, you know, that pat down ends all communication. And you know what too? Imagine a cop goes up to some, 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 some child that he already knew or he had a relationship because he's not doing pat downs. Right. And maybe something happens and the cop doesn't even know and sees the ch child. Doesn't even know the child has a gun on him. Goes to talk to him like he regularly does. And based on that conversation, the child says, you know what? I'm going to go put his gun down. Right. It's, that shit just... It just switched. The whole... Instead of... You don't know what's going on. Oh, you have a gun on you? You're going to jail. But you don't. You never saw the problem that he was going through. You don't know what he's going through. You know what I mean? And well, then the conversation wasn't even... Was even helping it. I, I see it like I see it in the opposite context. You know, I know I have clients that they get caught, you know, in their late teens, early twenties with a gun, and they tell me about how when they were, you know, twelve and thirteen and fourteen, they were walking home from school, walking home from a job. Some of them were walking home from like basketball courts or community centers, and they would be stopped and searched and frisked, and they were treated like they were, you know, standing on a corner selling drugs when they really weren't. They were just trying to like come from their tutors or come from their community center. And it gets to the point where they're like 16 or 17 and they're like, why am I going to bother trying to do things the right way if you're just going to treat me like I'm a drug dealer anyways and I want to be driving the nice cars and I want to be wearing flashy clothing so I might as well just start selling drugs because that's all you treat me like I am. Mm -hmm. And then the role models around the ways that had those things were of course. usually... Drug dealers. All right. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And so instead of the police walking up and being like, hey, you know what? Good job, man. I'm really glad to see that you're coming from the community center the, and the, the, encouraging people that are what? doing right, you're, you're pushing them to do wrong. First of all, as a peace officer, you're an example. Right. Like, people should aspire to be like you because of how you conduct yourself. Right. You know what I mean? The same thing with, you know, when we talk about. You know, uh, your religious leaders and so on and so forth. People are supposed to aspire to people. can't be, you know, less than less than that, you know, based on that. That's why even when you say we can't judge people based on the title, you know what I mean? Like, that's what, that's what I want to get into. So uh, so what is who judges the judge? What's that title? What is that, what is that all about? So I've been asked that a lot lately, whether or not it's like a slight at judges, and it's, it's really not. No, no. It's what it's based on is, you know, Judges supposedly sit at the very top of the justice system hierarchy. And who judges the judge is really about calling into question the way that we 
show respect to the various participants. You know, the reality is a lot of people that make their living in the justice system, so lawyers like me, prosecutors, um, obviously judges, court reporters. My wife counted. She said 16 people was in a courtroom. Right. But, but those people who spend their lives as making this a career, a lot of our identity is wrapped up into that title and who we are. And, you know, it's very rare to sit down and have an open, in-depth conversation like this about who you are as a person, right? And it's different from who you are as your title. And the problem with the justice system is that we automatically show respect to the judge and we automatically show disrespect to the criminal at the bottom, except without that criminal, there would be no judge because we wouldn't need it. And the whole system crumbles. But for that group of people, that large group of people that are on the bottom of the hierarchy. And the reality is a lot of those people have the qualities and the traits and the personality that we in society have respect for. But nobody looks at that because we're so busy judging them right off the bat by the title that they hold. And so that's the accused or the, the criminal in the system. But what you, what you have underneath all that is someone who's probably really smart or really loyal or really hardworking or really coming from an unfortunate set of circumstances that put them in that position in life. And, but for a different set of circumstances, they would be in a different position. And if we could give them the opportunity to let that personality and those personality traits come through, they wouldn't have that label, right? And so it's really about turning the system upside down to say, let's start looking at the individual. And by doing so, if we can help get some people you know, on their feet and out of the system, not only does the system benefit, not only does that individual benefit along with his family, but society at large, right? Everyone's concerned about these public shootings and everybody's being you know, shot at and we've got people shooting up malls and, it's, and parks and you know, parades. You name it. Everything. And that's because people don't care. The person firing the gun doesn't care if they hit a bystander anymore. They don't even think about it. They're like, oh, that's the guy that, you know, disrespected me last year. And and now I'm just going to fire off shots and hopefully I hit him without oh, thinking about the kids. Not in the even way. disrespect because hurt people hurt people. Somebody got traumatized. So now he's scared and he sees the person that traumatized him. Right. What do you expect him to do? Right. Which is what happened at, at uh, the Eden Center. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so if we don't do something society at large is just going to become more dangerous because people are going to continue not caring about all of the other people in the way people hurt people absolutely that's why i stay home <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we need to do a better job of saying like listen this is someone who is hurt or broken or mentally ill or suffering from a drug addiction let's find a way to get them help so that they can now help themselves help their families and the community is that much safer because they're not shooting wildly at people in a cafeteria and so the idea is really to open our eyes to the fact that we can't just judge people by their character. We need to take a minute and find out who they are as people. I'm glad you brought up mental health. What percentage of our community, of the community, do you think suffers from PT- PTSD? Oh, I, I have no I have no idea. I don't have the stats on it. No, but I'm just saying, do you think it's high? I do think it's high. And like how high? I think... I think that anybody who's been through the penitentiary system comes out with some form of PTSD for sure, for sure. that they need to address. For sure, for sure. And I don't think that people realize how traumatic it is for someone, especially young people in their formative years, early 20s, mm-hmm. that go through J-Unit, for example. You know, what mm-hmm. they're seeing and experiencing uh, My first experience in J-Unit was a riot. Right. My nose, I thought I was going to die. And I have a minor case. My nose is running. And the only way I could breathe was I had this little window. <sighs> nose is running. Like, trust me. Yo, stay home, man. Just stay home and be good. Trust me. <laughs> trust me, dog. Stay home and be good. Get yourself family and just stay home, fam. Be good. But, but I think a lot of people are coming out. I know, you know, I've had people tell me that they have to take two or three weeks just to adjust to the natural light, to adjust to the sound energy. of society. Just even energy. Absolutely. Get tired. Get tired. You know, I, I had a client in my office the other day, and, uh, and he did, I think, a two-year sentence. And he was telling me, before me, just for the record, mm-hmm. <laughs> before he met me. Um, and he told me that the biggest adjustment was not being called inmate. 
and actually recognizing that he had a, his own identity tied to his own name. And I never really thought about that. You know, I hear it when I go to the jail. You know what an FPS number is? An FPS? No. That's like the... The, the federal number? Yeah. 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 So even that, like, right. I, I remember that. Right. Because you have to know that. But just to be called inmate. Like, you're not <laughs> called inmate anymore. It's inmate, do this. Inmate, go here. Inmate, it's time for breakfast. And, you know, I, so I hear it when I go to the jails. And, you know, like, think about how disconnected you are from your own identity, even including your own name. But you know what, though? As an inmate, you could demand that respect still. Because I don't play that. Like, if I feel like you need to address me by my name, I'm going to tell you that. Right. So please. And then, moving forward, chances are that person's going to address you. If they don't want a problem. You know what I mean? So, I think it just means each individual just needs to... Because my experience is so vastly different. Like, I never, How old I, were you when you were doing that, though? When what? you were demanding that level of respect? Um, I was in my mid-20s. Okay. Yeah. Like, I never... I never I never fought once in jail. And I went through jail unit, I mean, all that stuff. I never fought once in jail. So I, my experience was very unique. It is unique. Very. Because I have clients that fight regularly. They yeah. stab people regularly. I have they homies. get stabbed regularly. They can't regularly. get it right. I'm like, you're they fine. Even, chill. No. Can't they be the time you can't chill? Just chill, fam. You ain't chill. No. I don't get it. Even the riot thing. We smash up our own thing. Yep. Uh, and then after the riot, we're like, uh, fix the thing for us right <laughs> oh it's, it's true. crazy it's true crazy. it's true but and then you come out and you're expected it. to function in normal society yeah. where we don't break our own things and you don't punch them no in the face you guys do right out here you guys do right out here <laughs> look at france yeah. <laughs> you, know, you got the yellow jacket so yeah it's still the same nonsense people you know but it's just more extreme because it's you know such a concentrated uh, community absolutely present. So, no, I do think a lot of people are coming out with what we would call at least some form of PTSD but what, what I wasn't even thinking about inmates. I'm just talking about in general as a community. Because I feel like as I a don't community... Know. When we start throwing that label around to everyone, then everyone feels victimized. That's my problem with the labels. Hmm. Is that, you know, when you put someone in a position of victimization... Like, for example. They don't want to fix themselves. Because they think, oh, it's just this. Rest in peace, Nipsey also. Yes. Did you see the video? Which one? Of how you got killed? Uh, no, I didn't watch the video. A lot of people saw that. That's yeah. traumatized. You know what I mean? Uh, I struggle with that being what traumatized you. I mean, you can certainly be, you know, impacted by it. I think a lot of people around the world were impacted by his death. Uh, and rightly so. He was a phenomenal human being and a huge loss. Um, but to say that yeah, you know, just seeing that video was traumatizing, I have a hard time with that. I mean, I... In a sense, they would, they would, like, uh, l there's a lot of content on the internet that is desensitizing people. Oh, yeah, there's live death videos right now. That's so what I'm saying. So, you can watch so someone get skinned alive on the we're internet. Getting we're getting get exposed and experiencing stuff that right. we're not even thinking. But that's no. been around for a long time. I remember no. when the internet first came out and there was live death videos and pictures so that were circulating. Up. By the time the internet thing no, I mean, happened, I, I was locked up. I think people have been exposed to that for a long time. And I think that when you... You know, when you compare someone who goes on the okay. internet to watch a live death video with someone who actually experiences the trauma of war, for example, you know, I have a hard time okay. having the same label on the trauma that they're experiencing. Okay. I'm going to, maybe not trauma, okay, we're going to go from trauma to a guy named Michael Breer. Okay. I, I don't know if you remember him. No. Uh, Holly Jones. You remember Holly Jones? Yeah, of course. That's the guy that killed her. Okay. He was watching child porn right. when he went to go look for her. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you see, like, There's a lot based, of up, too. based up what he's seen, right. he went, so, you know what I mean? The tra it's still the same thing. Like, you got to be careful what, you, what you're what you taking in, you know? I and, think and, it's desensitized, and, for sure. as a community right now, there's no filter. Right. Uh, is that, is that true? Is that fair to say? There's no filter right now. No, no, no. There's, there's not, it's like, all available online. Like, when I was a you child, the dark web, I felt you uncomfortable can see it all. sitting beside my mom and watching two people kiss on TV. Right. That's not oh, the no, case. Oh, no, there's none of that anymore. <laughs> That's not and the then, case. You know what I mean? No, that I do. That I do. So. And I mean, we touched upon that in the over-sexualization of, of society in general, for sure. And now, you know, in a lot of the images that are out there, there's this combination of sex and violence that's so readily accessible 